this morning, we are beginning a new series titled Recenter. Have you ever had one of those moments in your life in which you just feel disoriented and unfocused? Like you've lost track of the life you ought to be living? That was my experience every year growing up by the end of summer break. Now, at the beginning of summer, like in June, I was braveharting every day. Freedom! Loved being able to do what I wanted to do. But by the end of the summer break, I'm lying around on the couch watching reruns of Lassie and having an existential crisis. Does my life even matter anymore? What am I doing with my life? Ever been in that spot? Some of you maybe have moved recently. That can be disorienting, right? I mean, all of your patterns get broken. New neighborhoods, new commutes, new schedules, maybe a new job, new grocery stores. That's weird. You get into a new city, you have to learn new grocery stores. They don't have many of your favorite items. You can't find everything. Everything's a different price. Totally disorienting. What about athletes at the end of the off-season, right? They just kind of get in this malaise. This is why the famous football coach, Vince Lombardi, would start every football season by getting his team together and standing before them, pulling out a football and saying to them, gentlemen, this is a football. And then they would walk out on the field and he would show them the out-of-bounds lines and all the yard markers. And he would explain, again, the rules of the game, explain what the football was for, and ultimately the goal of the game to get this ball into the end zone. All of this to help his team refocus, recenter, reorient themselves to what they were trying to do together. We all have moments in which we need to be recentered. And so the main idea in this series is we need to recenter our lives around Jesus. We need to recenter our lives around Jesus. So let's begin reading this morning in Luke chapter 19. We will start in verse 28. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. As he approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling. It is written, he said to them, my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching at the temple, but the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him, yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. Let's pause a moment and pray. Lord, we love you. We give you praise in this place. We magnify your great name. Holy Spirit, we invite you. Have your way among us. Do what only you can do. And now, Lord, I pray that by your Holy Spirit, you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear and hearts to believe all that you want to speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. This is one of the most important moments in Jesus' life. 
For month after month, Jesus has been declaring that the kingdom of God is breaking into human history in a new way. And now, publicly and unequivocally, he is declaring that he is the king that he is the king. Now, Jesus does this through two very powerful symbolic acts. The first has to do with a cult. So Jesus and his disciples, as you may know, walked almost everywhere. But as they near Jerusalem, Jesus instructs two of his disciples to go to a nearby village and to get a colt upon which he will ride into Jerusalem. Now, why? Why did Jesus do this? I mean, was he just tired? Was he like the kid at the end of the day at Disney World? Like, I can't do it. I can't go anymore. And he needed a disciple. Why was he doing this? Well, he was doing it to fulfill the words of the prophet Zechariah, who had spoken centuries earlier. Here's what Zechariah had said. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. Now, the significance of this act was not lost on the disciples. Luke tells us, when Jesus came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Now, Jesus' second prophetic act has to do with the temple. The temple played a huge role in the life of those living in the first century in Israel. The temple was the focal point for Jewish worship. And the people knew that the anointed king who was to come, the Messiah, he would be the one who would restore and renew and cleanse and rebuild the temple. In fact, Zechariah had also spoken about that. Zechariah said, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Here is the man whose name is the branch. Branch became a symbol for the Messiah, this anointed king. And he will branch out from his place and build the temple of the Lord. It is he who will build the temple of the Lord, and he will be clothed with majesty and will sit and rule on his throne. And again, Jesus' actions were not lost on the religious authorities. In fact, they went on to say, tell us by what authority you are doing these things. Who gave you this authority? What Jesus had been hinting at all throughout his teaching, he now makes abundantly clear. He is the king. Jesus is the king. Now, kingship is the kind of concept that can be easily distorted. We've had a number of kings in recent American history. You may be familiar with a few of them. For example, we've had the king of rock and roll, Elvis, baby. How about the king of pop, Michael Jackson, MJ? How about King James? Some of you are big fans out there, perhaps. We've even got the king of marginal food, Burger King. (laughs) Our kings tend to come from the world of entertainment, and so we admire them, but we don't obey them. In fact, the last time we actually had a king in America, a minor conflict called the American Revolution ensued. So we're not real big on kings around here. Now, Jews in the first century also had opinions about kingship, and these opinions were not formed in a vacuum. In fact, one of the most significant events that shaped The idea of kingship in Israel was that complex of activities that is behind the holiday that we know as Hanukkah. So in 167 BC, on December 25th, a Syrian megalomaniac by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes came into Jerusalem, took over the temple, desecrated it, and outlawed the keeping of Torah in Israel. Now, Torah, the law of Moses, defined everything for the people of Israel. So this was a national crisis of the highest level. How in the world were they supposed to live without Torah? This is how they showed their devotion to God. And so this was a major crisis. And the problem was that Israel was this tiny little nation in comparison to Syria. What in the world were they going to do about this? Well, about three years later, 
a man named Judas Maccabeus, led a guerrilla revolt and pulled off the impossible by driving out the Syrians. In three years to the day after the temple was desecrated, on December 25th, 164 BC, they took over the temple once again and cleansed it and reconsecrated it to the Lord. Now, this was a huge moment in the Jewish conscience. I mean, a new holiday was born, a new line of kings was established, and firmly established in their mind was the idea of what a true king in Israel would do. He would defeat Israel's enemies. He would protect the land, and he would restore and reconsecrate the temple. Now, these were the kind of ideas that were in the air when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and started cleansing the temple. So there's a big question. What kind of king is Jesus? Is he just someone to be admired, like somebody whose picture we might put on a poster? Or is he a revolutionary like Judas Maccabeus? What kind of king is Jesus? Well, this passage shows us three things. Firstly, Jesus is a humble king. Jesus is a humble king. He rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. In fact, on a borrowed donkey. Now, a donkey was not a sweet ride in first century in Israel. In fact, there are a number of parallels between Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem and my and Jennifer's exit from our wedding when we got married years ago. Here's a picture of the car that Jennifer and I left our wedding in. (laughs) Yeah, I know. A 1988 Plymouth Horizon. (laughs) One auto critic wrote this about the 1988 Plymouth Horizon. The late 1970s through the early 1990s were some of the worst years in the history of the auto industry when it came to the design and performance of cars. The boxy little Plymouth Horizon hatch, also sold as the Dodge Omni, was the epitome of late 70s to early 80s automotive blah. Now, as pitiful as this car was, I didn't even own it. (laughs) This car was given to Jennifer by somebody else. The only thing I take comfort in is that this is basically how Jesus himself entered Jerusalem. I actually didn't realize how Christ-like I was at that moment in my life. (laughs) Jesus' entire ministry was characterized by humility, by humility. He didn't come to separate himself from the people or to use the people. He came to serve the people. In fact, a few days after Jesus enters Jerusalem on the donkey, he would tell his disciples this, The kings of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater, the one who is at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who is at the table? But I am among you as one who serves. Jesus is a humble king. He's a humble king. Secondly, Jesus is a transcendent king. He's a transcendent king. You know, Jesus' humility does not in any way diminish his holiness or his transcendence. Yes, Jesus was humble, but he also knew who he was. And in several places in this passage, this reality emerges. Firstly, he tells his disciples, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden untie it, and bring it here. A donkey was a very common animal, but this particular donkey had never been used for any common activity. In fact, God had been reserving it for Jesus to make his entrance into Jerusalem. And this was a powerful symbolism intended to communicate something of Jesus' holiness. There's something different about him. Yes, he's humble, but there's no one like Jesus. Secondly, after Jesus arrives in Jerusalem, some of the Pharisees began protesting the way Jesus' disciples were celebrating. They say, teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. You see, Jesus is not just a king over a little band of disciples or even just the nation of Israel. Jesus is king over heaven and earth. 
Yes, the temple belongs to him, but you know the very rocks on the ground belong to him. And if we stay quiet, the rocks themselves will cry out to him in worship. Now, as religious people, we may be comfortable giving Jesus the temple, but many times we don't want to give him the rocks. See, we'll carve out a little space for him, maybe on a Sunday morning or a quiet moment of prayer or a moment of meditation. But see, Jesus wants everything. He wants the earthy things in our lives, the ground that we walk on. He wants our work and our marriages and our children. He wants our victories. He wants our defeats. He wants our joy. He wants our pain. He wants all of it because he's Lord over all. He is the king of heaven and earth. He is transcendent. So if the disciples were to stay quiet, the stones themselves would cry out and worship to Jesus. Thirdly, Jesus is an invested king, an invested king. See, Jesus is all in. He's not aloof and unconcerned. In fact, Luke writes, as he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. This passage is full of emotion. Jesus is weeping here. His words are incredibly personal. If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. He's delivering this message of judgment to the city of Jerusalem, by extension the nation of Israel, that was causing him personally deep pain. It's an intense moment, and it reminds us that Jesus is all in. He is fully invested. Do you know that God feels our rebellion? He feels our sin. He feels our pain. He feels our shame. See, if God feels distant and abstract to you, I encourage you, study the life of Jesus. Jesus came to show us the Father. In fact, in a conversation with one of his disciples, Philip, Jesus said this, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Jesus came to show us the Father. And so if God feels far away and abstract to you, study the life of Jesus. He will show you God. The reason Jesus went about healing bodies and praying for children and spending time in people's homes is because he's invested. He is the heart of the Father, and God cares about his creation and his people. Jesus is a fully invested king. So how do we respond? How do we respond? It's a big question. And I think there's a lot of confusion around answers to this question. How do we respond? I mean, do we just admire Jesus like we might admire LeBron James or Michael Jackson and then just go on our way? Do we add Jesus to one of our list of life hacks, right? Keto diet, yoga routine, green tea, power naps, maybe even a nappuccino, and then Jesus. And now I'm ready for life. I'm ready to crush it. Or maybe do we respond by just saying, well, I'm just going to let go and let God. I'm not going to worry about it anymore. I'm just going to let God take care of it. Now, for the record, we should admire Jesus. And yes, Jesus will help your life. And yes, we shouldn't live in worry or anxiety. We should put our trust in God. But the reality is we don't really know how to respond to a king Kings are just not a thing in our world these days. So how do you respond to a king? Well, this passage shows us. Number one, you give up your donkey. You give up your donkey. You know, Luke spills a lot of ink describing how this donkey was obtained. He writes, as Jesus approached Bethphage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, surprise, surprise, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. Now, this is a remarkable scene. Jesus sends these disciples to acquire this donkey for him, and when the people ask about it, the only instructions that they are given to say is, just say, the Lord needs it. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I think I might have some additional questions after that if someone were taking my donkey. But it reminds us of something important. The king has the prerogative to take anything he wants at any time. That's the king's prerogative. In fact, centuries earlier, when the people of Israel rejected God as their king and went to the prophet Samuel and said, we want a human king, Samuel responded to them in a way saying, are you sure that's what you really want? Do you understand what kings do? And then he goes on to tell them this. This is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. He will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and of your vintage and give it to his officials and attendants, your male and female servants, and the best of your cattle and donkeys he will take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks, and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you will cry out for relief from the king you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. See, this is why almost every nation on the planet has moved away from an absolute monarchy. Nobody wants a finite, infallible human being to have that much power. But friends, the kingdom of God has a king, And it's Jesus. Yes, Jesus is humble. Yes, he's transcendent. Yes, he's fully invested. But he is still a king. And when the king shows up, you give him your donkey. You know what that means? It means your career belongs to him. And your time, and your family, and your money, and your relationships. It all belongs to Jesus. It's his prerogative. He is king over everything. And when the king walks in the building, you give up your donkey. Number two, you throw your cloak on the ground. You throw your cloak on the ground. So Jesus is riding this donkey into Jerusalem. And the disciples, in this spontaneous act of honor for Jesus, begin to take their cloaks off. And they start spreading them on the ground for the donkey to walk on as Jesus goes into Jerusalem. Now, Under other circumstances, if someone were to take your cloak and throw it on the ground to be trampled by a donkey, I am pretty sure you would unfollow that person. But in this case, Jesus' disciples willingly humble themselves. They effectively shame themselves in order to make all the more clear the honor and majesty of Jesus. Now, here's a question for you. What are you willing to risk your reputation for? What are you willing to risk your reputation for? See, we're very careful about what we honor publicly because it reflects on ourselves. In fact, sometimes you may be like a fanboy of something that you don't really want other people to know that you're a fanboy of. Like maybe you're a dude, but you've got all the soundtracks for all the Disney movies on your phone, and you don't really want people to know that. So if someone finds your phone, you're like, well, you know, I mean, I share an iTunes account with my sister, so she probably put those on there. And by the way, I mean, you know, they have great voices, you know, I'm just saying. Uh, I mean, I don't listen, but my sister told me they have great voices. See, we're careful about what we want to honor publicly because it reflects on us. It's easy to shame things, right? It's easy to trash some person or some team or some group or some musician or whatever. But we're very careful about what we choose to honor publicly. We feel the risk when we choose to honor something publicly. Now, what does all this mean when it comes to honoring Jesus? Well, it means that if we're going to really honor Jesus, many times we have to live counterculturally. We have to live counterculturally. See, the culture will give you a cloak to wear, a way to present yourself and make yourself known to other people. And sometimes if you're going to honor Jesus, you've got to take that cloak off and throw it on the ground. The Apostle Paul wrote this to the Corinthians. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. We need to come to him and say, God, my body belongs to you. And so I'm going to live counterculturally. I'm not going to Netflix and chill. I'm going to live for your holiness. I'm going to live to honor you. 
Sometimes honoring Jesus requires living counterculturally. And you know what? Sometimes you'll be shamed for it. People will call you anti-intellectual or prudish or unenlightened or backwards. You know, this is what they did to believers in the first century. All kinds of crazy accusations circled about Christians in the first century. I mean, people said wacky things like Christians are cannibals who slaughter infants at their initiation ceremonies. Other people said Christians commit incest at their private gatherings. Other people said Christians worship the head of an ass. Others said Christians are working for the downfall of Rome. Now, friends, if you choose to follow Jesus, things may go no differently for you. Sometimes to honor Jesus, you've got to take your cloak off and throw it on the ground and choose the shame in order to bring him glory. When the king shows up, you take off your cloak and you throw it on the ground. Number three, you open your mouth. You open your mouth. Luke writes, when Jesus came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Do you know our words have incredible weight? All throughout history, people have recognized that your confession is significant. In 112 AD, a Roman provincial ruler named um, Pliny the Younger wrote a letter to the emperor, Roman emperor Trajan, asking his advice on how to deal with this rapidly increasing number of Christians in his province. Here's what Pliny writes. In the case of those who were denounced to me as Christians, I have followed the following procedure. I interrogated them as to whether they were Christians. Those who confessed... I interrogated a second and a third time, threatening them with punishment. Those who persisted, I ordered executed. For I had no doubt that whatever the nature of their creed, stubbornness and inflexible obstinacy surely deserve to be punished. Now think about this for a moment. Pliny was executing them based solely on the confession out of their mouths. For the words they spoke of devotion to Jesus, they were executed. Now, somewhat from the opposite direction, the Apostle Paul writes this to the Romans. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. Friends, our words matter. Your confession matters. Words are significant. Now, look, we all know, of course, of moments when people just kind of spew out words that they don't really mean, but this doesn't take away from the reality that our words matter. When we gather together on a Sunday morning and the team comes up to lead us in worship, we shouldn't just stand back and watch other people. We need to open up our mouths and declare the praises of God. See, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, his disciples began quoting, declaring from Psalm 118. And so when you go home and you pray and you have moments in the scriptures, open up the Bible, turn to the Psalms, and begin to declare who Jesus is, declare his kingship, just as the disciples did out of Psalm 118. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. Let us rejoice today and be glad. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God and I will praise you. You are my God and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Friends, Jesus is king. And when the king shows up, you give up your donkey. You throw your cloak on the ground and you open up your mouth and you give him praise. Let's go to our God in prayer. God, we worship you in this place. Lord, we confess that many times we don't really know how to respond to a king. Every earthly king is flawed. Lord Jesus, you're a perfect king, perfect in humility, 
perfect in holiness, perfect in your nearness. And so God, we choose today to humble ourselves before you, to offer up freshly everything to you. Lord, our our time, our emotions, our jobs, our families, our money, Lord, it all belongs to you. It's all for you, oh God. Lord, I thank you that when we give a donkey to you, it doesn't just stay a donkey. But Lord, you change, you change the world. Lord, whatever we put in your hands, Lord, you multiply and you do something great. Just in this moment of prayer, you may be here today and you may be thinking, I want to follow Jesus. I've been kind of doing my own thing, living life my own way, but I want to follow him as my king. I want his purpose for my life. I want to come alive to the things that God has made me to do. I want to know God. I want his hope. I want to turn from my old way of living, and I want to follow his paths. If that's you today, I just want to encourage you to take a very simple but concrete step to take a moment to grab one of the cards and the seat backs in front of you and to fill it out. And on the back of that card to indicate today, I am making a commitment to follow Jesus Christ. Lord, I thank you that as we take these steps, God, you meet us. You make all things new. Lord, today we say we want you at the center. God, refocus us, reorient us, recenter us around who you are and your purposes and your mission. Right now, Father, I pray for every person in this room who's feeling like life is just a little chaotic right now, who may be feeling that things are uncertain, who may be feeling fear or anxiety. Lord, I pray in this moment Lord God, that you would recenter each of us around your son, Jesus. That our focus would be on the king. And Lord, you would order our steps. God, we give you praise. Jesus, you're fully invested. You gave your life that we might have hope. Have your way in us today, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give him praise today, church.